I can see your cover slide now, Marcus. You just, just, uh, you can just unmute. One billion, two billion. I guess that works. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to present Norwegian savings banks, my favorite topic. Um, and um, on the picture, you can see the Stone Fjord, the longest fjord in Norway, and the bank I'm going to talk about. Uh, Sonspar Bank. It's located in the eastern part of this fjord. Um, so, um, a disclaimer: I guess most people joining a micro cap conference doesn't need to know to hear it. But do your own due diligence, folks. Um, yeah. So, a short introduction. Um, I'm from Norway, um, been investing since 2008, and around 30% of my portfolio has all the time been in small cap uh, uh, banks. And um, for the last seven years, I've uh, had uh, different uh, management positions in two small cap companies. The last two years, I've been a CEO of a company called Aega. Now I work uh, recently joined Fancom, a Tencent subsi gaming subsidiary um, based here in uh, Os uh, Oslo. And uh, I'm also the founder, co-founder of Nordic Small Cap. Um, we're a forum uh, based on uh, Microcap Club and Value Investor Club. We try to steal their best, uh, best concepts and uh, adapt it to the Scandinavian market. So we started in uh, January, and at the moment we have about 15 members, high quality members. So we're looking for more. If any of you are interested, uh, send an application and we'll be happy to hear from you. <laughs> um, yeah. So why do I like to fish in the saving Norwegian saving bank uh, pond? First of all, um, the saving banks don't have shares in the uh, normal sense. They have what we call uh, equity capital certificates. So that makes it a bit more complicated for investors to understand that. Ask you know, quite a lot of banks uh, in Norway, and it's been con consolidating for the last yeah, 100 years almost. And uh, in Norway, we're quite patriotic to the regions where we come from. Anecdotal evidence, but uh, for example, I've been by the, with the same bank since I was born. Um, and as long as they support my soccer team, I think I will stick with them. Um, and almost all of the investors, excluding the top five banks, are Norwegian, have top, the top 20 investors are Norwegians. And uh, yeah, let's face it, banks in general are boring. Norwegian saving small saving banks, even more so. So I, I guess it's not where the, it's not the main focus of uh, today's investors. So a short geography lesson. Norway has the second longest coastline in the world after Canada. And they are only 5.4 million spread over, over the country. As in other, uh, all over the world, urbanization has been a trend for a long time where people move to the cities. However, um, Norway is somewhat more resilient than the rest of the world. We still have um, quite active local communities spread out the com uh, over the country. And uh, that's the bread and butter for these smaller uh, regional banks. So in the latest poll, 21% of the uh, population in Oslo would like to leave Oslo. I don't know if this is more of a short-term trend or more 
yeah, to reflect that they're tired of seeing the inside of their 10 square meter apartments, or if it's a more longer term uh, shift where they see the possibility to work from home. We have excellent internet coverage almost all over the country. So it's really easy as long as your employer allows you to work from home to, to actually do it. Um, so at the moment, Norway have about 150 banks. So it's one of the highest densities of banks uh, per capita in the world. Um, if you exclude, of course, Switzerland, Luxembourg and the banking capitals. Um, however, there's just five branches per 100,000 inhabitants. So that's one of the lowest densities. Um, and uh, it's mainly because most people use online banking in Norway. So anecdotal evidence again, but I haven't been at the bank uh, for uh, at least 10 or 11 years. And I bought the house in that time and so on. So everything is done online or, or by phone or most things. Um, yeah, so a bit general about industry. Um, the average founding date of the uh, saving bank is 1892. So they're quite old, all of them. At the moment, there's 92 banks. Four of them are uh, have agreed uh, to merger into different merger processes. Um, and 29 of them are listed after the merger, I think it would be 27. Um, so and all of them have a regional focus. So yeah, we'll come a bit back to that later. Um, and uh, most of the banks are a member of an alliance. Um, so there's three alliances and they in the alliance on uh, IT spending is the main part to stay current with IT systems and so on. And um, they also um, uh, sh share compliance costs to uh, yeah, keep up with all the extra compliance requirements. And uh, to, um, they get a lot of their product offering from the, the alliance. If you look at the um, the funding of the banks, you can see that the main funding part on average is the deposit from customers and they pay quite poorly interest rates uh, at the moment, of course. And um, yeah, so that's the main part. Um, so as I mentioned, it's not shares in the normal sense in the saving banks, it's the capital uh, certificates. The main difference here, as you can see in blue, um, uh, is that the um, top tranche, tranche, the first to take losses, is an ownerless equity from the founding of the bank, uh, normally owned by a foundation. Uh, they will take losses first, and then the equity certificate capital will take losses after the, the first tranche. So, Let's say you're invested in a saving bank, they post annual losses of 100 million. As long as that's uh, the ownerless equity is above 100 million, um, the ownerless capital will uh, lose equity share of 100 million, and this will go to the ECC. So the ECCs will increase their ownership of the bank. Um, another difference is the election of boards. <laughs> So that's quite a complicated process in saving banks because it's not like in normal companies where the shareholders choose in a saving bank, you, it's chosen by politicians, uh, choose a certain amount of members, customers, employees, and then the ECC holders. So of course, at times you want to rip your hair, but uh, on the other hand, they avoided some of the worst uh, scandals because they're not super aggressive and lean on the conservative side, at least historically. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a fast consolidating industry. In the 1920s, um, you had above 600 banks and uh, 
it's now fallen. As I mentioned, last count was 92 and it's now down to 90. Um, and uh, the biggest drop rate uh, or the de decline rate has gone a bit down, but still at, I think it will uh, keep up because there's a lot of uh, regulatory pressure from the EU, Basel requirements and so on for a small bank to keep up. And also the IT spending, even though we're in alliance, you need to yeah, keep it uh, up to date in, inside your bank. Uh, so I think we'll continue to see some consolidation. But there's quite slow processes because, as I mentioned, you have politicians, customers, and equity holders should all agree on the mergers and employees. So that takes time. Um, yeah. So to the uh, view of all the listed saving banks, um, these are sorted by asset under management. So the top five ones are each for the main regions of Norway. Um, the West is largest and then middle of Norway and then East Coast, South and Northern, Northern Norway. And the ones following after are smaller regions. Uh, the one in light green are listed on your next growth, so it's probably a bit harder for foreigners to get access to because they have like less uh, reporting requirements and less liquidity normally. The one we're talking about today is Song Sparbank, the one in blue there. Um, so it's the cheapest on price book, um, so 0 0.6 at the moment. And that has a good reason, their return on equity, 2.4% in the fourth quarter and now around 5% over the last, um, last five years. So it's had quite low returns. But then again, they also have about 20% uh, core tier one capital ratio. As you can see, all of the banks have really high capital ratios. That has two main reasons. Uh, First is that Norway has one of the highest in Europe. They've added some extra on the EU um, regulations. So that for the saving banks, it of course depends a bit on risk weights of the bank and so on, but it's around 14%. The second reason it's so high at the moment is that for the financial year 2019, they weren't allowed to um, and distribute the dividend due to COVID. So they held back capital. And then now in the, the financial year 2020, they're not allowed to give more than 30% of the net profit for the last, uh, last two years. So the, quite a lot of capital have been held back, but you can see that they started, most of them have started paying dividends uh, at, at least a decent rate. Okay. So Songs Bank. if I told you it's a company that can't go up four times in 10 years, the revenue growth will be less than 5%. Um, it's really low liquidity, uh, less than 10K US dollars uh, traded on average per day. Today I saw that it was actually 15 uh, K dollar, US dollars because they reported their first quarter today. So it's a bit more, but still. It's really, really low liquidity. And the return on equity has, as I mentioned, been 5%. And the financial is all in Norwegian. Not only Norwegian, it's a certain dialect from that region. So it's even hard for Norwegians to read. Um, is that something you might be interested in? Sounds tempting, right? Um, OK. So let's dive in. The, the bank was founded in 1846. It's a result of six mergers. Um, now in 2019, the last merger took place where three banks combined and uh, formed what's known now called Sognsparbank. Um, and they're part of the ICA alliance where they own about 2% of the alliance. Um, the largest competitor, DMB, that's the largest competitor of all the saving banks. They, they have about 26% of the national loan market. But their share have been decreasing for uh, the last 10 years and the saving banks have been gaining ground uh, as a group. Um, 
So in the local area of Sogn, there's another saving bank, Sparbank in Sogn of Fjordane. They're focused more on the western part of the fjord, so they don't overlap that much, but still they're competing uh, uh, on this, uh, in the same area. So of course, my dream scenario would be a merger. Sparbank in Sogn of Fjordane is about seven, seven or eight times the size of uh, Sparbank in Sogn, and they have quite a lot higher return on equity, about 10, 10 and a half percent over the last three years. Management, this is another <laughs> drawback of the, the saving banks. That's the CEOs and boards have really few shares normally. So here the CEO has 400 shares. Programs, no incentives, no nothing. So that of course has some drawbacks on capital allocation um, and the incentives. But on the other hand, <laughs> the bright side is that in the 2020 and 2019 reports, I've checked uh, recently and they didn't even, they didn't mention extraordinary adjusted non-recurring uh, at all. So even though they did a merger and downsized, uh, gave severance packages to their staff and so on. So at least you get more uh, conservative financial statements, I would say, than most, most banks. So let's do a deep dive into the financials. Um, as I mentioned, the merger happened in April 2019. So 2018 and prior has been, uh, I've combined uh, three banks and to get comparative figures. In 2020 and 2019, the losses have been quite high, a lot higher than the historic losses. Uh, in 2020, it's um, mainly due to a general provision for um, COVID of about 10 million. And in 2019, they had a large customer that equated for about 22 million of the, the loss. So it's hard to say if that was a cleanup due to the merger or if that uh, yeah, was an actual um, new, new loss that they found. Um, so in my assumptions, I would think they come back more to the average a bit above because you will always have some large engagements going wrong every now and then. So I would say around 10 million. Um, or if you get 2008 over, over again, you will probably have more losses. Also, in um, the costs in 2010, they mentioned that they had about 10 million in um, merger costs with lawyers and so on to merge the three banks. And then 2020, they had about eight, nine million uh, of cost to uh, to give severance packages to 11 employees. So the bank has a market cap of um, of about uh, uh, 70 million NOC. So that's about uh, 8 million USD. So it's really small. That's, of course, only the uh, equity share the, uh, of the ECCs, uh, which is just in this bank is just 13% of the total equity. So the complete equity is quite a lot higher. And you can see the ROE is about 5.3%, so quite low. Um, so my investment thesis, if you start with the 2010 20 figures and you're just uh, up for um, that I think they will lose on average less than they did the last couple of years. And from 2022, you will see the savings when the, since they cut 11 employees. I assume half of like um, and they have done some other uh, uh, efficiencies with IT systems and so on. So you have a bit more saving. And then the big one, but of course the most uncertain is if they're managed to act or use more of their capital. 
um, since they have the highest capital ratio, if they come closer to the average, it would be a high uplift. So if we go a bit back to the to the overview here, you can see that uh, the small banks, a lot of them have around ROE of even 8%. So if they manage to come up to uh, revert to the mean with around 8% um, on the capital and you buy the price book uh, 0 0.6, it wouldn't be that wouldn't be that bad. And uh, then you have the potential of, um, of mergers continuing. That would give even a bigger upside, I would assume. So the main risk, local employment, I would say, is the, the highest risk. Um, in uh, Norway, the loans are personal, so it's not like in the US that you can just leave the house if the debt um, accumulates above the value. So they will fall the, the persons, but still, if they lose their job and they, they will have problems to, to serve the loan and uh, that will again probably affect them the housing prices. So that's the main risk. In the region, people are mainly working in agricultural uh, businesses and um, tourism and uh, fishing and oil. So it's quite diverse, but still it's cyclical businesses. So that's definitely a risk factor. Um, and fintech online solutions, they're coming in Norway, but still uh, quite small compared to the total market. But I wouldn't assume large growth, as I mentioned, in any of the banks. Um, and they've enjoyed a uh, decreasing rate over the uh, last 10 years. So they've always been slow to give the customers the benefit when the central bank decreases the interest rate. And another risk uh, is a further urbanization of the population, since this is quite a non-central area that more people would move to, to larger cities would, would be a risk factor for their losing their client group. Yeah, thanks for your attention. And uh, I'm available on Twitter and now for questions. Thanks, Marcus. I mean, one of the questions for me was um, dividends, you know, going forward, if you look out one or two years, I think if you, if you go back to that slide that has all of the individual banks on it, is it yeah. are they on, a, on a yield of, uh, what was their dividend yield now? Just go back one more slide, please. Um, or yeah, so I mean, they're on... Uh, their dividend per share was six and a six and a half now, and um, yes. so it's nearly, you know, a five and a half percent dividend yield if we take the one hundred nine share price. Um, yeah. where do you, where do you think that dividend could go as you know dividend payouts and things normalize after COVID? Yeah. If we look one, two, three years, do you think you know that potentially could go from six and a half Norwegian crowns to, you know, eight and a half, nine over the next like one or two years. Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, uh, good question and point. Um, yeah, I think the next, next couple of years, they will probably lift uh, dividend restrictions. There's one bank already now um, trying in court to, to, to lift their restrictions a bit. And, um, yeah, I think the next couple of years, I would think they yeah, pay out a lot of the held back capital to be more efficient. So around eight to 10 would not be out of the realm of the possible, I would say. Okay, so then you're talking, you know, you're putting them, it gets to, you know, nearly a 9% yield, uh, you know, growing, growing up to that mm -hmm. if we use kind of this uh, 109 share price and then another um, quick question that I had was the I guess merger I think we talked to just quickly offline yesterday 
when these mergers happen, um, there's a lot of staff that uh, are on various boards and committees and credit boards that over time you've observed in other mergers that these start to kind of disappear out of the out of the the governance structure over time once the the merger settles down is that the is it the same with spar bank you know that yeah. you've three the three yeah. banks came together and they've all brought their own people but over time you know these boards start to you know get smaller and recognize uh, that it's just like one bank i guess rather than combining all three sets of people yeah definitely so at the moment they have about 60 people um, in different type of boards and uh, leadership positions and uh, they normally have to keep that to get the merger to be completed because politician wants to keep their positions and so on but over time what as you mentioned we've seen in other mergers that it's cut gradually down and yeah, that eases the bureaucracy a bit um, definitely so that's a potential upside and are these people paid would that bring down the cost base or is it more a, uh, a, a, a small small um, a small cost overall it's quite small but of course it takes a lot of time with so many people involved but uh, the costs are quite low uh, for those kind of positions but so yeah you could cut out a couple of million per year, I would assume. Yeah, we've got two questions uh, here. Um, do they provide any financial information in English to your college? <laughs> uh, no, they don't. Um, they don't have any presentations or anything. So the best way to follow them is by subscribing to Nune Analyze Mark. I have the link there. Yeah. Um, Okay. And, and they give updates on all the companies in English. Okay. So great. then you can just kind of screen out from that and uh, use Google Translate. Uh. Yeah. And then we have another question uh, from a shareholder of some of these uh, spar banks. If you go back to the slide with the, all the banks, they want to know uh, uh, some of the larger ones, which would be your, um, your top picks. He says he's a, yeah. a shareholder of Sparbank, uh, Northern Norway, and, and Western Norway. But what would be your yeah. one or two picks if we go a bit up the up the uh, sector? Yeah, so Northern Norway, I think they are really the best capital allocators, and also SMN in the middle of Norway, because at least in Northern Norway, they kind of view themselves as. Uh, <laughs> A separate species from the rest of us so they they want their own bank and yeah therefore and they almost have a monopoly up there so their capital returns have been quite quite good over a long time and also the middle of norway um, has similar characteristics but i personally struggle to pay more than book um, so that's mainly because that, of course, makes mergers and so on a bit less attractive for other players. Uh, there would then be more the acquirer. And um, if they distribute um, more to the ECC holders than to the foundations, your ownership share would be diluted to that price book uh, values. So. That's kind of the downside of ECCs if they distribute more to you and then the, the foundation. Yeah. And um, yeah, because what are they? They're 1.3 for Northern Norway yeah. and where's the West one? Also, yeah, also 1.3. Um, yeah. yeah, so not definitely not as appealing as the 0.6 for, um, for Sparbank. <laughs> No, I like cheap uh, on price book, but uh, of course, Sparbank in West, I think, is the best on technology. They have done a lot of innovations and have started to get a reach also beyond their region. So they, they of course, they have some other selling points uh, than their smaller ones. Okay. 
Okay. Maybe just uh, since we got that question, maybe just go back to the slide where you have the link just uh, so people can uh, know it down just in case they didn't um, manage to know it down before I came in with that question. Okay. Uh, no one that no analyze. Okay, great. Um, yeah, if you if you want some kind of English uh, analysis, as you say, that's the best the best place to go. Okay, mm -hmm. if we don't have any further questions from Marcus, uh, it doesn't look like it. Marcus, I think we're going to leave it there. Um, I know Dave is waiting for us across the Atlantic in. Pennsylvania. So thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting topic, especially for anybody who's a value investor on here.